thank you. I'm going to take this off since I've got a hermetically sealed chamber here. And I appreciate the applause. I haven't done anything, but maybe that's why you're applauding. <laughs> so uh, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly exciting to be here with you. I'm delighted. I'm, I'm very positively impressed that so many people want to come out and hear me hear me talk, and I'm very enthusiastic about hearing what you would like me to talk about. Um, what, an exciting, what an exciting time to join Montclair State University, um, and I couldn't be, I couldn't be more delighted. I, I'm going to start off in a funny way by saying that I'm not, I'm not blind, as any of you are, to the circumstances in the world on which we gather, right? Like, this is a, this is a unique moment. Obviously, and I'm sure there'll be questions, but obviously we're concerned about COVID and where that's going and, you know, what are the next steps, not just for the university, but for society. But more than that, right, we gather at a, <laughs> we gather at a difficult time, right? I mean, the, the, the world is fraught. There's all kinds of things going on that are caused for concern in terms of the environment, in terms of our politics, in terms of our culture. We feel, we feel enormously divided as a people, and I, it's much more profound than red and blue and R and D, right? Like we have fundamental schisms in our society about how we assess reality, right? Like that's a pretty fundamental thing. Like what is the world, right? What is truth? Um, like that's pretty significant. We have fundamental divisions about what our values are, about what we stand for as a community, as a country, as a species. Um, and so, wow, this is pretty intense stuff. And, and I realized for me to say that, like, oh, this is, this is great. Like, thanks. <laughs> um, so the reason, the reason I start with that, and as I say, I know it's, I know it's a little strange, but I don't know if, I don't know if you are all exactly like me, but I have to actively work to sort of tamp that stuff down in my brain, right? Because it feels it feels like a significant moment in the history in the history of the world, and 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 not necessarily with a rainbow at the end, right? So so the reason why the reason why I say that, and the reason why I start with that, is because I honestly two reasons. One is. I honestly believe that universities, that higher education is a significant, not just part of the answer, a significant part of the answer to all of those things. Uh, I, I, and, I, and I'm not just saying that rhetorically, I truly believe that. By the way, I truly believe that universities are a significant part of the explanation for those things. <laughs> right? So, so, so partially I say it's the answer and partially I view us as having a responsibility for addressing those issues because I think we have some culpability in creating those problems, in creating those divisions, in the failure to address issues, in the creation of suspicion of institutions. We have to take some ownership of it and therefore we have to be part of the solution to those problems. But I say it also, even if that wasn't the case, I think we as members of communities of higher education, as people who are committed to making universities work, to seeing students succeed, we have the power to be the antidote, or at least a part of the antidote, to all of those ills. And so I take that very seriously, and I, I'm excited to be part of an institution which in its DNA, I think, takes that very seriously. And so I think, that's, I think that's fundamentally why I'm interested in higher education and why I wanted to be at a place exactly like Montclair State University because it is consistent with the values of this place and, and, and obviously that work has never been more serious. I mentioned it also, I mentioned it also um, at the outset because one of the reasons I love to be on one of the reasons I love to be on campus, and one of the reasons I love being with students and people who are associated with universities, is that it is a fundamentally optimistic environment. Um, and I do believe I do believe optimism is probably the most important a attribute to have 
in a moment like this when, time, when times are fraught and the future seems dark. Um, the belief that tomorrow can be, will be better than today, that a year from now will be better than it is now, that a decade from now will be better, that is fundamental to solving problems. If you don't believe that, right, it is very hard to put in the work, to make the commitment, to make the investment, to find the solutions. And the reason why I say that universities are fundamentally predicated on optimism is that the whole endeavor, the whole point of a university is future oriented. Right, so you have students, and you feel it, right? Like, so it's good timing, right? It was really nice. There were all these signs that said orientation and stuff. I was like, so nice. They put up orientation signs for me when I arrive on campus. Like, incredibly welcoming, um, just for me. Um, but you feel it, right? There's there students showing up for their, you know, for their first day of college. They they've been looking forward to this for years. They're excited about the future. They're, they've worked really hard to get here. They're planning to work really hard. They might have loans. They might have jobs. Their families are invested. Right? There's a lot that's gone into this exercise predicated on the belief that if they work really hard for the next year, two years, four years, five years, whatever, they will make a better future for themselves. They will make a better future for their families. And all the data bears them out to be correct. Right? So there's a reason for that. They're not irrationally optimistic. They're correctly optimistic. And so I find being in this environment is absolutely essential to maintaining my own optimism. I mean, my own possibility. For I've said this to numerous people over the last couple of years, which is I don't think if I were not surrounded by students who are totally confident that they'll figure it out and they'll make it work, um, I would probably have a much deeper feeling of despair than I often, than I often do. And so I do, think, I do think we are, in some sense, as a community, as an institution, we are sacred guardians of optimism um, and this, this belief that we can, we can make this work because we've seen it work before. I said, um, I said in a, a graduation remarks a few years ago um, that I, I you all, you all know the, everybody knows the sort of famous FDR, you know, equation. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself, right? Like, so we, know, we all know that. And we've all said it so many times, you don't really think about it very much. Like, what does it mean? Like, what did he mean? And I'm like, oh, now I get it. Like, now I get it, right? Which is, which is the, if fear is the emotion that grips you, it's paralyzing, and it causes all kinds of dysfunction in terms of, in terms of how you behave, in terms of how you see your fellow citizens, in terms of how you interact with other people. Fear is the enemy, right? And the opposite, in my opinion, the opposite of fear in the context in which we are operating today is optimism. And so that's, that's why I mentioned those, that's why I mentioned those sort of dark, you know, sort of undertones that are there as we gather today, as we all look around at each other wearing masks, which we thought we were done with, right? Um, is because we have to hold on to that, we have to hold on to that positive impulse um, and carry it through because the minute you, the minute you lose a grip of that, it is, it is a downward spiral. Um, and so I'm excited because I'm filled with I'm filled with optimism. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't have, in my opinion, arrived at a better place, an institution that has done so much, um, where the dedication to the mission and the purpose, which I've already, I can kind of, you can kind of feel it. It's like in the frequency of the institution, and I've interacted with some folks already. I'm looking forward to interacting with more. Um, it's, it's palpable, and I feel like this is an institution that has done an incredible amount already. But the sense that I have from everybody is, yes, we've done a lot, but we've done a lot to get to the point where we can do much more. Um, and we can really show uh, what this institution uh, is capable of. And so I couldn't, I couldn't, be, I couldn't be more thrilled. Um, and so rather than, I, you will know this about me, I can talk at great length. <laughs> I know this because I just a couple of weeks ago, like people have been saying super nice things to me in Phoenix, and one of my uh, one of my colleagues 
did a did like he wanted to do like a roast, like a Dean Martin sort of celebrity roast. And I can conclude from that. that I am able to talk. <laughs> so I'm also able to learn. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that as an introductory, as introductory uh, remark. And I know things are on your minds. And I wanted to, uh, and I wanted to hear. I, I'm really interested in what people want to hear about, what people want to I'm sure I can cover whatever it is I would drone on about in opening remarks in response to your, in response to your comments. So why don't we, I think we have some microphones around. We just need to use the microphones because there is somebody doing closed caption for the webcast and people won't necessarily hear. And it turns out that we're not as easily understandable when we're talking through a piece of cloth. Uh, I don't know. Like, who knew? Who knew? Um, so, so please do raise your hand and use the microphone. Somebody's got to go first because that's the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Russo, 20-year teacher here in political science and law, um, but more importantly, 21 years on the council in Montclair, making me much more aged, and having been former mayor, uh, I'm giving you the clerk's sealed seal of the Montclair government, which is what I wear, and I gave mine last year or two years ago to President Cole, didn't like the fact that it was worn by me. <laughs> I'm giving you a sealed one, you can put it on yourself later. <laughs> Said it was you. Happy to wear your pin, Bob. But, but Are you trying to pin me on our first meeting? Importantly, <laughs> Montclair Jazz Festival. You'll enjoy this, so it's not a government thing. But I just want to say this. We've had a good relationship with President Cole, all the faculty, all the people who run this university. I've taught here for 20 years, and we want to keep that effort going. Mayor Spiller and Councilman Herlock from this area, Upper Montclair, where I used to be councilman, but Mayor Spiller, the whole council, wish you the best. Good luck. There's a note in here about that and welcoming you to Montclair as a community. President Cole, when she was leaving, said that the reason the university was located in Montclair is because we didn't have any bars or liquor or anything back 120 years ago. We've got a lot of that now. <laughs> it's, my, it's my real privilege to work here and to welcome you here and to give you the pin that you can wear at your leisure. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. I actually got to meet the mayor yesterday, which was great, and uh, and I've had uh, lots of email conversations with people. You'd be amazed how many connections there are between Montclair and Arizona. So I've had lots of people introducing me to their good friend, or you know, I grew up in Bloomfield, right? Like I got a lot of these. Nobody in Arizona is from Arizona, so it's not that surprising. Um, but but let me just use that to say. I'm excited about the relationship with the town of Montclair, but I'm also excited about the relationship with the surrounding with the surrounding communities and seeing how we can build upon all of the great interactions that already exist between university programs, uh, between university programs and the community. I was I had the pleasure of being at the Center for Pedagogy yesterday and hearing about the great teacher education programs in Newark and other communities. What an what an incredible thing! I know that in the health fields and in other programs, there's already tons of engagement with communities. And so it's a priority to me um, to build relationships with those, with those communities, the leaders of those communities, not just governmental officials, but also civil society groups. Um, it's, not just about, it's not just about government. Um, and and I, I've learned firsthand that those personal relationships and the trust that has been built, that all, many of you have been involved in building trust, as you say, over 20 years, right? That is an incredibly valuable resource, incredibly valuable resource. And we talk, when people talk about resources, they generally talk, they generally mean money, but those relationships, those trust, those things that you all maintain, those are the building blocks of educational programs, of research programs, right? That, that is, that is gold. Um, and so I, uh, I'm totally committed to it, and I appreciate the I appreciate the welcome from Montclair, and look forward to doing new things. Yeah. There's a hand over there. Thank you, I'm David Axrod, instructional specialist. 
instructional specialist, uh, economics department. And, um, you know, given your opening statements concerning, you know, how we're kind of isolating and separating in society, what do you see as the role of, in, of um, interdisciplinary studies in kind of unifying all the different fields that we have as a way to, you know, leverage uh, more connection? and the way we think and connect with people? So I guess the way I, generally, the way I generally think about interdisciplinarity is that my mindset, and, and you've, you already know because you've, you've read a little bit about my background and my orientation, I'm excited about the idea of the university as a problem-solving entity, right? That it takes on complex issues and um, and comes up with answers. Um, and I don't, I, I, I like to move away, even though the, I sometimes collapse myself into it, so I'm trying to train myself to do this, to get away from only thinking of it as solving problems, also thinking of it as achieving our aspirations, right? So don't, let's not only frame this negatively. What do we want society to be? What is our, what is our, what is our end game? I can't think of any either problem to be solved or aspiration to be achieved that can be addressed within a single academic or disciplinary silo, right? So the only way, realistically, you're going to do anything of significance that has impact is to pull together people from, pull together people from different disciplines or different, uh, different orientations. And so I don't, I think that the, I think that the, sometimes interdisciplinarity falls down on the on the justification being almost tautological. Like, why are we interdisciplinary? Because interdisciplinarity is good. It's like, well, OK. <laughs> I don't think, but if you say, why are we interdisciplinary? Because we need to be in order to be effective. I think that's how, I think that's how you get there. And I've always, the, the, this is a sort of nerdy academic way to, to, to think of it. But I've always noticed that a lot of interdisciplinary faculty collaborations, right, on research or whatever, you ask how it started, and it's because I ha we were on a committee together, a doctoral committee. And it's like, yeah, because the student figured out who she needed on her committee. She hunted down the right faculty member, brought them together, and then the faculty member was like, oh, like, oh, she was right, like, we could do stuff together. And so the student solved her problem of who she needed on her doctoral committee and found the right person. And so I think that's I think that's the answer. If I were to extrapolate that to the broader social point, I would say, yeah, we need to have that realization too, which is a lot of the problems that we're facing collectively are going to be awfully hard to solve unless we get people of different backgrounds and different orientations to at least talk to each other. Um, and so there is, there is a broader analog to that. That's pretty complicated. I mean, that's fraud. I, mean, I don't want to go too far there because that's complicated. But, but, um, but I, think that, I think that's how it has to be. It can't just be like, we are for interdisciplinarity, and therefore you should talk to, you know, you, literature person, should talk to this physicist and go. I, I, don't, I don't think that does anything. There were other. Oh. Funny, if, if Mr. Russo didn't speak, I wasn't going to speak. Uh, I, a number of things. My name is Ani Karatkin. I've had the uh, honor, distinction of being an adjunct professor here for 33 years. And uh, I live in Little Falls, so I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Mayor Damiano and the Town Council. As you may not be aware, that 90% of the campus of MSU lies within the barrier of Little yeah. Falls. Uh, I'm also the uh, member of Local 6025, uh, representing adjuncts, and on behalf of our President, Mary Wallace, who's out of town, I'd like to welcome you. And at some point, I'm sure we'll all meet. Yeah. And last but not least, I think I'd like to say, at some point, I'd like to talk to you about Bronx Tales. You talk about a connection. Uh, probably before you were born, I had a relationship. I was a, a young student intern with Bob Abrams when he was Bronx Borough President. And I've had a working relationship with Bronx community organizations for 30 years. So I'm familiar with uh, Riverdale, et cetera. And one last question. So does Marvin's Corner ring a bell to you? Yeah, what is that? But I know it's at the Bronx High School of Science. It's a, a pillar, a plaque in honor of Marvin Markman, who was a guidance counselor there and a, a sincere friend of mine who passed away too. Yeah, I knew the phrase was familiar. I just couldn't remember what it was. But welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so I've heard from a lot of people who are like this. This is less surprising, but I've heard from a lot of people from the Bronx. 
and, and a lot of people, and a lot of people from Riverdale, and uh, and so that's sort of that's sort of fun. Um, I can't now. I can't remember. The, I got an email last night. Now it should be. Hold on, Margo from Margo, who said, I used to work as a, I worked as a counselor at a camp in Riverdale, and I remember there was a kid who was the son of the assemblyman. Would that be you? <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> so yes, so I expect, and Bob, a Bob Abrams I only knew when I was you know, three years old. <laughs> Bob Abrams, for those of you who are not Political Buffs was uh, was the Attorney General uh, in New York for many years, and actually was sort of a friend mentor to my father, who was in politics for many years. So nice to hear familiar 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 friends. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Is there a microphone in this neighborhood? Um. Good morning. Oh, you're going. Oh. I'm so sorry. All right. You um, guarded the mic. <laughs> Well played. Good morning, right. President Copel. My name is Guillermo Estrada, a part of the Executive uh, Student Government Association. I'm the Executive Treasurer. Real quick, I would like my Executive Board to introduce himself, Great. and I have a few questions for you. Great. Good morning, everybody. I'm Michelle Lanada, the Executive President of the Student Government Association. Good morning, everybody. My name is Carla Farfan. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Student Government Association. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chrissy Rosales, and I'm the Executive Secretary for the Student Government Association. Well, once again, welcome to Red Hawk Country. Um, and I have a few questions for you. Have you ever worked with a student government before? Um, and how important do you believe student leadership is on campus? And what are you going to do to help that? So yes, I, 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 and I think we have a meeting scheduled. I think it's this yes, fr Friday. On, fr on Friday. Friday. Yeah. yeah so yeah. yeah. So it's a total priority, right? I wanted to see. I wanted to meet with you guys um, as as soon as as soon as possible. And that was always a really important part of how I conducted myself um, as dean. And it's going to be that much more important uh, in this role. Um, I view I view you as being the core purpose for the university. Universities are here for students, right? Not, not everybody doesn't always remember that. <laughs> um, that is the purpose. Um, and you have to have not just a voice, but a feeling of ownership over this institution. And so what I want to do is have, make you feel like you have that ownership and you have a say in the operation of the university. Now, part of that also means, and I think this, I think this is the part that, this is the step that often gets missed, right? Which is, it's also incumbent upon, not just me, but us, and I think we've got a lot of staff at the university here and, and leadership of the university, us to provide you the education of how this place works so that you can make informed decisions. I've been impressed with the way in which students process everything they hear about how the finances work and what the considerations are and sure and sure students if they don't understand those things might say or suggest things that make others who do understand those things roll their eyes and it's like well of course because they don't know right but so so my my view is then let's help you understand so that you can make an informed you can make an informed observation and in my experience when students understand those dynamics they often come up with Superior solutions because of the perspective that because of the perspective that you bring to the table. So I'm excited. I'm excited to work with the student leadership. Um, I think that that's uh, that's going to make the institution stronger. The more involved you are, and I'm excited about putting you in a position, all of you and the and the and your colleagues that you represent, putting you in a position to be um, really effective effective contributors that can that can be colleagues and partners as we work to improve the university. Thank you very much. And I look forward to having a conversation on Friday. Thank you. Other hands. Here we go. Hi, good morning. I'm Kara Baldwin Brennan. I'm uh, the Director of Annual Giving in the Office of Development. Hi, Colleen. I see you over there. <laughs> um, I'm also a proud member of the class in 1992. And I just want to share with you that Montclair State is the largest employer of our alumni. And we have a great constituent of alumni ready to work with you. So on behalf of them, welcome. 
Thank you so much. It's really striking to me, even in the in the in the short time of interacting, how many sort of Montclair lifers there are. Um, <laughs> People who, people who went here and then have worked here for decades and have said, you know, I've been here 20, 30, 40 years. That says something pretty significant about the institution, right? I mean, nobody's holding you prison, at least I don't think. Um, <laughs> so the fact that there are so many people, you know, like you who have this, you know, extensive <laughs> Uh, association with the university and feel so passionately about it. Um, I think that speaks volumes about what the what the community is, what the culture is, and and that needs to be honored and embraced and sustained. So thank you so much. There were other. There we go. Good morning, President. Welcome, by the way. Uh, Jim Campanella, uh, Bi Department of Biology. Uh, I've been a professor there for 21 years. God help me. Uh, <laughs> The university has, within the last several years, become a Research two university. And we're still sort of working to, to completely get up to that level. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on that were and what you think we need to, to completely reach uh, the quality that we need to be. Because there's a lot of components in the university that aren't really, and a lot of people will tell you this, aren't quite up to that level yet. Right. But yeah. Go, uh, so I think. I've talked about this a little bit in the in the previous venue, but I think research research and particularly externally funded research requires an infrastructure. Um, and the the reality is that it's very hard. Like this is one of those things where you can't get it first and then build the infrastructure after. You can do that for certain things, right? Um, but it's very hard to do that on the research front because, quite frankly, putting together a compelling proposal for NSF or you know uh, NIH or whatever the you know the the big funders that most people have in mind. There's there's a lot of not just work involved but knowledge involved in putting together a budget and writing a statement and um, and making it compelling. And so you do have to build up that. I'll talk inside baseball that pre award that pre award capacity. Um, and I know it exists to some extent, but it probably needs to. It probably needs to grow. Um, this is, I actually think this is an exciting time to do it because if you look at particularly the federal funding of research, there's a pivot going on in terms of what types of programs are refunded and, and how, how proposals will be judged. It so happens that the, uh, that the director of NSF is an ASU, former ASU colleague of mine. Uh, uh, Everybody calls him Ponch because they can't say his last name. Um, but uh, he he recently created a sort of new rubric for judging proposals that puts an emphasis on social impact and um, and community engagement, which speaks directly to the interdisciplinarity point. So that means that you can build an infrastructure that's directly attuned to the time um, that we are operating in. And I think that a university that a university that builds its infrastructure in a way that is oriented towards the sort of values that are being embraced at this time can thrive. It actually, it knits together a lot of the things because that means that the strongest research proposals, particularly, um, particularly proposals that are gonna be evaluated in this way are gonna be ones that have a community engagement component. So having a good relationship with Montclair, Little Falls, Newark, Patterson, right? And being able to bring those partners in and being able to show that that's part of the research design from the outset are gonna be stronger. Hey, guess what? That's been the bread and butter that I've worked on for the last 11 years. That's really hard, right? Like, that sounds really easy, um, but it's really hard. And when you have community, when you have community partners involved in research, that has to be done very carefully um, and very collaboratively. It can't be, research scientists coming in and studying communities. It turns out that people don't like to be lab rats. I know that's surprising. They like to be, the way we talked about it uh, in my previous college was they like to be co-PIs. Um, and so you have to develop that capacity and that culture to do that. But, but all of that takes time, energy, resources. And so the question is how do you, how do, you do it and how do you build it? And that, you know, I don't have an answer to that yet except to say, I don't expect that you just snap your fingers and all of a sudden 
you go, you know, you go to $100 million in externally funded research. Um, it does require some intentionality and, and design to get there. And yes, some, some investment. I'm, I'm not sure where, OK. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Jeff Schoenfeld. I'm one of the associate registrars. Um, so my question is kind of broad. but um, So I had originally come from a corporate environment as well. I've been at Montclair. I was also an alum myself. But my question is kind of twofold, and that's um, how, what are your thoughts and sentiments on professional development, um, both internally and externally? As I know, budgets are tighter, so that means less external. Um, but it would be nice to see more internal development. I know on reappointments, things like that, there's always questions as far as um, leadership development, different things like that. So uh, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on that for both new employees that want to feel welcome, but also existing employees. Yeah, so this is one of those things where I can't give a very specific answer because honestly, I don't know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> so, so I can give you a, I can give you an overarching answer. You will generally get very candid answers from me. Um, so, so I I feel strongly, and I I assume that we've got a largely staff audience here because it's in it's in August, so the people who do the real work are on campus, right? Um, <laughs> no, so I think I think you have to have trajectories for people to grow, right? And so people can't feel like people can't feel like they're stuck. Um, and so you have to have you have to have opportunities for growth, which means which means that that means there should be some sort of training and and growth program, whatever that looks like. And that, this becomes a sort of administrative question: Is it more efficient to do it in house? Is it more efficient to have resources? For, I don't know. I don't have and I don't know what exists, so I'm not going to say what needs to be changed or not. I just don't know. Um, I do know that that should be a value, and there should be something there that provides those opportunities to grow. And I've always felt that. Um, you have to encourage people to look for opportunities to grow. So the dilemma, the dilemma that, that I think that hap what happens at a university is you have a place that people want to stay, right, because they like it here, and other people are always looking for talent, so you, you have this potential dysfunction where units are poaching good staff and people are growing by hopping around from unit to unit. That can be, that can be dysfunctional, right? Um, and so, the question is, how do you balance those things? Like people having an opportunity to grow, but also some constancy and not this sort of everybody's looking over their shoulder and figuring out what's the next best, what's the next best opportunity. I heard there's an opening over there. And I mean, like that can, th that can cause problems. I've seen that, I've seen that firsthand. So ideally you put people in positions where within their job they can grow and they can acquire new skills and they feel like they're, and they feel like they're getting, they're getting something they're learning something even as they're doing as they're doing their job and we should try to create jobs that allow people to grow without feeling like they have to hop over to the next thing um, along the way and so you want to create you want to create I think a work environment and quite frankly work rules that allow for, that allow for that um, because otherwise otherwise everybody gets otherwise everybody gets frustrated so that's a, that's a, a general answer I realize and that's one of those things where I'll I'm sure I'll get educated. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I see somebody's hand way back there too. So after my question, I hope that she's had her hand up a bit. I think. I think it's a she. I'm Dorothy Rogers. I'm going into the Ed Foundations Department in the fall. I've been here 20 years. Um, I've been in other departments. That's a longer story. <laughs> um, but I was thrilled to see the students ask questions. And um, my question's about diversity because we have one of the most diverse campuses um, in New Jersey, in, in the country. Uh, but the faculty numbers and diversity doesn't reflect that. So as an ally, I'm asking um, what kind of plans you might have for diversity. We do have a diversity hire initiative, which I've lobbied for in the past, sometimes very hard, sometimes going back to the dean's office and trying to insist. But it's not always you know, something you can do if you're in a small department. Um, some universities do cluster hires to increase diversity. But uh, I think faculty diversity is a big concern for all of us and faculty full engagement and inclusion, uh, recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to know what you think about how you might proceed in that regard. Yeah, so I think, look, I think faculty diversity is really important. I think leadership diversity is really important um, and something that 
it's something that I, you know, I believe needs to be needs to be addressed uh, at Montclair State University. First of all, for the reason that you said, um, we've got an incredibly um, diverse student body, which is terrific. Um, but there should be some representation that matches the student body and the faculty and leadership uh, of the university. Um, but it's not, I want to be clear, it's not just, oh, well, there's percentages and the percentages should match, right? That's not what it is. It actually comes back again to where, and this is where I was going a little bit before in the answer to that interdisciplinary question. You have to have diversity of background, diversity of experience, diversity of opinion, diversity of orientation, if you're going to get a full grasp of the problems. It's sort of like what I was saying about being educated in response. If you're going to actually make informed decisions and provide a full experience, then you need to have multiple perspectives brought to bear. Um, and, and the thing is, it's not easy, right? So the, 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 the experience that I've had is that simply saying, well, I'm in favor of diversity and we should you know, build a diverse pool, that, 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 it turns out that just saying that doesn't do anything. Um, you actually have to drive it back. And you actually sometimes are going to frustrate people because everybody says that. But then, um, and I'll tell you, when, when, in my own experience, when I'd get a list of candidates or people that want to interview it, and I'd say, uh, no, uh, keep working at it, um, you know, people don't like that. Um, and people always say, that department should have done a better job. We did a good job, but that department should have done a better job. And so nobody likes to be, nobody likes to be pushed back um, uh, and say, well, you're not, quite, you're not quite doing it the way that we expect you to do it. And so that's, that's the reality of it, which is you can, you can do those things and you must do those things, but it's not frictionless. Um, um, and so, so I, that's, the, that's the approach that I take, which is to have higher expectations of the processes that get you there. It's not just hiring, right? It's, it's what's your promotion. I mean, I, and, and, it's, and, and we should be scanning the environment and saying, like, well, what are other people doing? Um, so I read this article I read this article um, a few years ago that said it was really interesting. It talked about P and T process. Now I realize not everybody here is involved in that, but you know, for P and T process, you send out requests for letters when somebody's up for promotion or for tenure, and you send it out to you know, ten, fifteen professors. And the point that this essay I read said is you know, most it, it talked about this. It's, it had some statistics, but the point was there's no diversity in the people who are asked for their opinions. Um, and I was like, and, and therefore it becomes recursive, right? So then who's considered to be an established voice and established expertise and whose opinion is therefore valued? And then when, when the committee is looking at the letters, they're looking at a bunch of letters from a non-diverse set of letter writers and that reinforces who has status in the profession. And I hadn't, honest, hadn't really thought of that. Um, and so I said, okay, we're now going to do that. I was like, that was impressive. So I said, we're now going to require a diverse set of reviewers. And so for the first, well, mostly for the first time, I would get lists of reviewers and I would reject them and send them back. So the faculty in the room can tell you how much they would love that, right? When, when some administrator, right, let's just call it like some administrator who's not in my field is telling me I have the wrong reviewers. Who the hell does he think he is? Right? I mean, this is, let's, let's just be honest, right? So that's the, that's the rub, right? Which is, if you're going to do those things, eggs get broken, and, that, and so you have to be willing to do that. I'm willing to do that. I think it's, I think it's important. It's non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable uh, imperative that we face. And again, it goes back to where I started. If we want to be the best university that this can be, that is a non-negotiable part of it. And so we have to figure out how to do it. There were, I know there are a bunch now, like we're really getting it, we're hitting our rhythm. Yeah, back here. Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm AJ Kelton. I'm the director of the CHSS Digital Media CoLab. This is my 23rd year working here and BA 98 MA 04. So I've been around a while. Right, we're getting a um, pattern. <laughs> <laughs> we have just been through an incredibly traumatic two years. Most, if not all, of the people in this room became my heroes two years ago when in two or three weeks they took 
what they had been doing for a very long time and transitioned it in a matter of days. Right. And these people need to be congratulated in the industry for that work, right? I've been involved with technology since coming here, and there's always been a conflict between the acceptance of the use of technology and education and whatnot. And over the course of several years, digital pedagogy, technopedagogy has become significantly more uh, important, uh, higher profile on campuses. What are your thoughts on di digital pedagogy and specifically how it might relate to tenure, promotion, and whatnot? So, um, so first of all, I totally agree. I think that this group and this, but you were representative of a population at multiple institutions, not just universities, right? K-12, who, who did this incredible pivot. Um, and so I totally, I totally agree with you. Not properly, not properly recognized. Um, and so I appreciate you, I appreciate you calling that out. Um, look, there are, there are some silver linings to what we just went through. And so one of the silver linings is, that a lot of the old bugaboos about um, technology and education and distance and remote learning, a lot of those have been just exploded, right? That it turns out that it turns out that you can do a lot. You can do a lot um, remotely, and even if you're not even and and that's not the only way that techn and that technology can be an assist in a lot of other ways, not just not just distance, uh, not just distant learning or remote learning, and that actually some stuff that we thought, and this is true even uh, where I came from at ASU, that synchronous is not that much harder to do than asynchronous. Um, it also, I, so, so I think that's a big, I think that's a significant thing that there's much more acceptance that, oh, this actually does work from both a teaching and from a learning, the student and the teacher both, I think, are like, huh, I didn't, I didn't think that would be the case. Um, now, there are a couple different things that have come with that. Um, one is that left to their own design, a lot of people would just as soon stay in their pajamas and zoom into class than coming to campus. Um, so that's significant. Um, and two, uh, it turns out that to the extent we do a good job of teaching pedagogy, we could bracket that question, right? To the extent we do a good job of teaching people how to teach at the university level, we certainly don't do a good job of teaching people how to teach using these new modalities. Um, and just like, just like classroom teaching, some people are naturally pretty good at it, and they adapt, and they do their own research, and they figure it out, and other people are a mess. Right? Like, like, that's not terribly shocking, but we've seen it now. We've seen it now in real time. So for the latter, I think there has to be some intentionality about giving guidance to teachers, by the way, and learners, right, about how to interact in these method, in these modalities, and establishing norms about how we deal with them. And they're not simple, right? Like just the just the very prosaic question, which I'm sure I'm sure it's many of you probably have had it in your own homes with your own children, or whatever, like, is your is it appropriate, is it okay to turn your camera off during class? And 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 we would say I think from the educational point, we say no, that's not right. You can't if you if you turn your camera off, you can't engage. You're not there. You're not accountable, and it's like tricky, right? Because you don't know what's going on in their home. That you have the luxury of saying that because you have a nice private room where you can be online. You don't know there could be three kids online in the same room. Like you don't know what people's circumstances are. So before you make some glib assertion about what's appropriate, like it gets complicated, right? But we have to establish what those things are, what expectations are. What are norms of decorum in a chat room? Right, like these are, these are all real things. Actually, I think the first part is the more complicated one, which is when you once you know how good these things can be and how powerful they can be as a substitute or supplement to face-to-face -face learning, what do we do different in the face-to-face -face environment than we did before? And so, so I, I had quite a few conversations about this. I mean, it was funny, right? Like, a, a, you know, a month ago, I was wearing, you know, I was wearing different logos and stuff like that, right? And so I was having these conversations in Arizona, and the conversation there is always, 
And I think it's funny, right? How do we shut off, and it's, it's not an Arizona conversation, it's a national conversation. We have to shut off the, the remote learning possibilities because otherwise people will just do Zoom, they won't come to class, right? And we need them to come to class. I get it, I get it. Like, that's a real thing. Like, that we've, we've seen it with our eyes. And I think, that's, I, think that's, I think that has to be part of your consideration. There's another part that has to be, that, and this is pretty profound, right, which is, what do we do in the classroom that makes it worth it for somebody to get in their car or to drive to, or get on the train and drive to campus? What are we gonna do differently pedagogically in person that can't be done remotely that makes somebody excited about coming? And so now you get into this stuff about flip, flipped classrooms and I just know it's not gonna be the professor standing at the front of the room talking. Because, because, because the marginal difference between sitting in the room and seeing the professor at the front of the room and watching it on my screen is not enough to justify the time and expense of me getting to the classroom. And we can say, oh, well, they're lazy or these damn kids or whatever, but how many people are going to the movies when they could sit at home and watch Netflix, right? So we're behaving the same way. So we, so, so there has to be, there has to be an experiential difference. And what I've heard from students is that <laughs> what they, the reason they want to be on campus is because of the campus stuff, right? The life stuff. It's not because they miss sitting in Professor Jones's lecture. <laughs> I, I mean, um, unless it was Indiana Jones. I, that was, <laughs> that was, that was accidental. Anyway, so that, that's my thought on that. But I think, it's an opportunistic moment, but it's an opportunistic moment that's not just about technology. It's about, it's about the whole educational enterprise and what we are offering here. Um, hi, welcome. Um, I'm Laura Valenti. I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Student Affairs. And so I just want to turn for a minute to um, graduate student life um, and the stuff that happens <laughs> outside the classroom. Um, Obviously, as we've grown to R2, there has been an enormous um, uh, support, you know, amount of support and foundational um, uh, infrastructure for getting uh, increasing graduate student education. There hasn't been a commensurate um, increase in in the outside of the classroom experience for graduate students mm -hmm. um, because this is really new to us, right? So there's been an increase in doctoral assistantships and things like that, mm -hmm. but um, there is no graduate student um, government, for example. Um, there is no graduate student activities fee so that there can be um, graduate student events on campus, things like that. So um, I don't have a specific question other than to ask you, what your thoughts are and where your priority might be um, at how we're going to better integrate graduate students into the lifeblood of the campus. So my main thought, which is I think probably, probably the response that you, would prefer, I, I, that you would like, which is I don't think you can just say students. I think graduate students have a different set of needs and agenda and interests than undergraduate students. And the minute, especially at a, especially at a university that's been primarily undergraduate and is sort of growing its graduate component, the minute you say, well, what are student issues or what do students think? It's going to become an undergraduate student conversation, which doesn't mean that's not an important conversation. It's just a different conversation. Um, and so I think that, I think that that, I think that's everything you said I agree with, um, in terms of the need to Think, think that through and what does it mean? I do, I do actually think, actually relates to the previous question. I think graduate education is even more, is gonna be shifted even more radically. That the idea that, um, the idea that people are gonna, you know, move cross country to do a two years master's program in residence, I think that's gonna fade um, very quickly. With, sure, there's always gonna be an elite space where people are gonna go and get their Harvard MBA or whatever. But, but I think in the main, Graduate programs, um, particularly when I'm talking about master's programs, when, when I'm saying this, those are going to be those are going to be increasingly hybrids. There'll be a face-to-face -face experience. There'll be a distance or an online experience. Some of it will be synchronous. Some of it will be asynchronous. And I think there'll be these very interesting dynamic mixes. Which, by the way, again, to my sort of similar to my point about research, I think 
Montclair, by virtue of sort of moving into this space at a moment of change, is in a really good position to define those hybrids and to build programs around these new designs, and quite frankly, to build a financial model with fees and so on and so forth that allow you to provide the things. The other thing that I've, I've come to view, um, particularly in graduate education, although this is to some degree true of undergraduate education as well, but definitely true of graduate education, um, demand, here's, here I'll earn, earn some credibility with economists in the room, demand is less price sensitive than people think. Right, so that people find what they want to do, and if you if you increase the cost by three hundred dollars a semester to offer a better experience for that master's degree, people will happily pay it for the experience. They're not going to say like, "Well, I can get I can get a cheaper master's degree a little bit down the road, so I'm going to do that." I, that's just generally not what my not what my anecdotal experience has told me, and so you're better off building in a price structure that allows you to offer a program that's compelling than doing it the cheapest possible thing, thinking that you're gonna compete on price. That's just not, again, that, that's not my experience of how it works. I would, I, I've been facing this way, I feel like I wanna face this way. Hi, I'm uh, David Trubach, I'm a faculty member in Applied Math and Statistics, and in the last several years I've been involved in various um, governance and like larger picture activities on campus at the university. Um, so the university is large, it's complex, it's grown fast. I think the mention that there's no graduate student government is a kind of a, a image of window that it's grown fast and in some ways it's um, not put a premium on being organized and more on being on growing. And uh, so the, I think a question is um, that means that it's not so easy to find out how things are actually going because it's not like written down or we haven't been doing it this way for so long. So one question is, uh, how are you going to figure out about this university? How are you going to, what are you going to do? Clearly, there are going to be a lot of meetings, but um, just to give some visibility to what you're doing, I know that, you know, I've heard that there's a lot going on, and, yeah. but for you to tell us, like, more broadly, like, what's your plan to figure out what's going on? And then the, related to that, uh, I think um, there's a tension or a difficulty sometimes or sensitive where, um, many of us have been here, uh, I say, I've say I've been here a medium amount of time, I think we've been here a long time, so we have a lot of the past in our minds, so on the one hand we don't want to be stuck relitigating past issues and concerns, on the other hand, where everybody you talk to comes from is based on the way things are and they have been, so it's important to be informed about that. So I guess my question then is, how are you going to get yourself informed so um, you can provide, a, you know, coming from outside, provide leadership that's based on, on the experiences that we all have? Yeah. So I'll give a, that's a, that's a, that requires a pretty long answer, actually. So so let me give a uh, let me give a sh let me give a short ver a short version, which is really more about how I see how I see this all working well. So so to the first part, I you know I, I don't and I don't intend to do things in sort of a smoke filled secret room with a coven, right? I I I um I mixed a whole bunch of metaphors there, but. Got this weird Tammany Hall witches thing going, but so I tend to be very visible. I tend to be out. I'm a person who likes getting out. I like being out on the campus. I like interacting with a lot of people. I like, I, as I said yesterday, I like universities. <laughs> I like what people do. I like engaging with the academic enterprise to hear what people are working on, what projects they're doing, what their goals, what their goals are. I like hearing what students are working on. I love to know the story. I like. I love to know people's stories. I always. That's how I always start. Um, and um, and so, hopefully, you'll know what I'm doing because you'll see me. <laughs> you'll see me doing it, and you'll hear from other people like, "Oh yeah, I just talked to that guy. That guy, you know, two days ago." And so I'm. That's my. That's my hope. And part of it is having, quite frankly, a communication strategy of telling people, telling people what I'm doing. Um, and I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn as quickly as possible, and not make, not make judgments in a vacuum, and not make judgments based on one person's version of reality. Right. So that's why I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear about about training or opportunities because I don't know. Right. So and I and I will, I will not do that. I will not say what people want to hear just because of what they want to hear. And so let's deal with the last thing you said. Because a really important point, which is, you're right. If the if the person's if the person who comes and meets with me and they decide they're going to relitigate 
something that they were unhappy with 15 years ago. And when you've got people here for 30 years, they can tell you all the dumb things that have happened over the last 30 years, right? Like they can, they're ready. Um, that's not a strategy that's going to work terribly well. Um, what works from my point of view is what do you want to accomplish? Right? What is your aspiration? Right? Go back to my aspiration point. What is your aspiration? What is it that you see as possible for the university? Don't tell me how you got screwed 10 years ago. I would like to know what you want to do now and what you think I can do to help empower you to be successful. Right? That's, that's, the, way I, that's the way I think of it. And um, and it's and it's it's a very positive thing. And yes, I understand that there's sometimes some context that says, well, in order to understand what I'm trying to do, here's the barrier that needs to be removed. It was put there. Fine, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Um, but I'd much rather be focused on this is what I want to do, and then here's the important second part. And this is why I think it's important for the university. This is how it helps student success. This is how it helps our communities. This is how it helps. Montclair. Not like, this is what I want to do, and this idiot assist assistant dean stopped me 10 years ago. This would be really good for the university, and if only I were empowered to do so, man, we could do fantastic things. Yeah, there's one over here. Hi. Her first, but since you got handed a microphone, you, you'll get oh, okay. the last question. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. President. I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> My name is Maria Vasquez. I'm an assistant community director in residence life. I'm also a grad student here. So I'm glad you like mentioned at the beginning that like it's no secret. Everybody's going through things and, you know, we spend then a year in COVID-19 and everyone has their own baggage that they've been dealing with, right? But even before um, COVID-19 and everything that's been going on, it's been, through research, right, it's been shown that students on campuses, whether they're undergrad or grad, they've been suffering with different mental health issues, depression, anxiety. Um, and, and on top of that, right, minority groups get affected on another level based on, you know, extraneous factors and everything. And considering like Montclair is, Hispanic serving institute. I guess I'm interested in, in like your view for mental health, not only for students though, but for faculty as well, because I think that's something we really need to talk about. Um, not just because of the pandemic, just because I think that's something that's always been dismissed and kind of pushed aside. Um, so I'm kind of just interested on your view for student mental health, you know, and faculty and staff. So. Uh... And, 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 I'm not, and I'm not saying that just, but, and staff, because I think staff have been, um, no, because staff have been in many ways the most dramatically impacted, and we've asked a lot of staff to put themselves in a position of vulnerability. Um, and I'm not talking just about the university, right? It is the university, but we're talking about societally. Right, we say, oh, frontline workers and you know essential workers. It's like, oh, really? Um, hmm. How do we treat those people? Um, and so, I I think it's a great question. I think a lot of us are, in some sense, I, this word gets overused, but there is a collective trauma um, that we are experiencing. Part of it is COVID. Part of it is. Um, race related and it gets boiled down to George Floyd it's much bigger than George Floyd that was a catalyst for a lot of other stuff to be acknowledged um, and a whole lot of other a whole lot of other stuff going on in society that has that has taken a toll on us and some of its some of its macro um, and some of its micro that results from the macro right like it's hard to like be in an apartment with your kids like all the time and like you're going cra like you're going crazy and you're trying to navigate all these things you're trying to navigate all these things simultaneously and maintain relationships and you know take care of parents and all, like it is hard um and the thing that i think the thing that i think is interesting about universities in 2021 is people are somehow comfortable articulating those things in a way that they weren't before which is good. I think it's good. It's powerful change, but they're expecting the university to be part of the answer on that. I, I, you know, that's a really interesting thing. I mean, 
I saw a survey in the last couple of years that said that something like 70% of incoming undergraduates expected to use counseling services in their time in college. Expected to use it. That's extraordinary. I think if you had done that, I mean, I didn't, they didn't do this, but I think if you had done that survey 20 years earlier, it would have been under 10%. or something. That would be my guess um, for a lot of different reasons. But so, so the question is, how do you do that, right? That's, counseling is hard to scale, <laughs> right? Um, and so I think, I think that's a very tough, that's a very tough question to answer. I think, I think that the, I think that one ingredient to that is going to be something that's not just about provision of services, but also about creating a culture and a community of care where people are sensitive to what colleagues are going through and try to ask the question like before I say well that person's just a jerk or this is difficult like what's actually going on right we have to be and I think this is again I hate to say well this is a broader problem because I keep saying the same thing but I think it is like we have a crisis of empathy in this country um, and this is part of it right we're just we are we are so we and now I'm going to sort of get a little bit sort of so about like we've we've embraced this sort of narcissism and it's all about me and so if that person isn't attentive to my needs immediately I'm ready to like jump down their throat and rip their heart out um, and uh, and 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 honestly that's partially cultural I mean I I, I laugh at myself um, at like that my New Yorker comes like I'm in Manhattan for two seconds and my inner New Yorker comes out like the light turns green I'm like come on go cross the street which is weird, right? Because I would never do that in Phoenix. Like everybody's, <laughs> everybody in Arizona is nice. Like it's like it's sunny all the time. And like I, I walk out of Kennedy and it's like, come on, get out of my way. It's, I mean, it's, it is funny. So we have to, we have to adapt ourselves and say, wait a second. They're, I don't know what they're going through. Um, and try and try and embrace and try and embrace that and, and try and be, attentive to each other's needs. And I know that sounds like that's my Mr. Rogers answer, and I'm not, I'm not eliding over the fact that there might be some adapt adaptation required in terms of what services are available. I think that is, I think that is part of it. But it can't, be, it can't be that this is something that is exclusively somebody else's problem. Right? We have to have some ownership of it. I did say that we're going to have one last question, and then Keith is telling me we've got to wrap up, so we're going to we're going to do that. So let's do the last question. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, actually, great segue. Um, I'm Lisa Lieberman. I'm the chair of our academic department of public health. And great. so the you know, thousand ton elephant in the room is COVID. Um, and I, you said something earlier. That's, I'm, now I've got this thousand tongued elephant in my head. So I'm like, <laughs> um, trying to get past that because okay. it's like, um, it's not Ganesh exactly. It's something other. Yeah, you said something earlier about um, that the best thing about academia is our students and that having our students and being with our students is really what makes us tick. And I didn't, I think I always realized that, but I realized it at graduation, which was we had an in-person graduation and I walked up on stage and saw my graduate students sitting in the front row who I hadn't seen for a year and a half and I literally burst into tears, um, realizing that that was the thing I was most sad about. Um, and so to that end, the obvious thing is that the pandemic has not left us. We are entering a new phase. We're all wearing masks again, and I have not been wearing my mask indoors until two weeks ago, and right. I've now done that consistently. And I just would like to hear your thoughts about how we go forward to assure that we can maintain the health and safety of our students and our faculty and our staff and be back together and stay that way uh, because this is a changing thing. And I just would like to hear you talk a little bit about your plans going forward. Yeah. So, so as, as you all know, and you're a public health person, so you know that the, there's almost a minute by minute change. So we're considering options and considering what those plans will be. So I don't have a, I don't have an answer. And even if I did have an answer, it might change, right? It might change, right? That's the nature of the world that we inhabit. But let me, let me build on what, what your premise, not the elephant part, the other part. Your premise is, um, and this relates to the sort of self-centeredness. We have, 
we have lost sight of one of the most critical elements of living collectively, which is that we produce public goods. And the public, the public good that I'm committed to preserving is our ability to gather together. Um, and that means that we have to do things that allow us to gather together, whether that's wearing masks, getting vaccinated, taking tests regularly. Those are things that we do individually to create the public good of us being able to assemble as a community. And that is an incredibly valuable public good. And, and, and let me be clear about that. When, and, and, and I think it's important when people talk about individual versus collective. People suffer when they're not able to gather collectively. There is a cost that is paid by some. So the, the, the question of what we are willing to do or not do individually is a question of shifting the cost from one party to another. And so I think we all have learned over the last couple of years how much we value the ability to be together and how many people pay a price when we cannot. And so we are going to make decisions based on that premise that there is that we are a community communities create public goods together and that you don't allow one set of individuals to presume that other individuals should bear the cost of their choices and so that's the that's the premise that we'll be operating on and we're going to try and we're going to try and implement any plans that we do in such a way that you minimize the cost to all individuals but 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 i'm a, a strong believer that we have to operate with some sense of the collective and that, that there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's fundamental to what, to what it means to be in a society and to operate, and to operate as a community. And so, that, that, so it's good to know at least that's the premise of any decision making. So thank you. So, so, so by, and by the way, I agree with you, I, I agree with you 100% about graduations. Um, I, uh, I, when I first started ASU, we did graduations in the fall and the spring, every fall, every spring, it was a, and we do a lot of ceremonies. So I was like, oh my God, so many ceremonies. Like, it, and, and my opinion totally changed by the time I was done. I was like, the ceremonies were like a battery recharge for me, because I got to be with the students and see what it was all about. And I started doing this thing, which I would take a selfie at the graduation, and I would say to the graduates, if I don't take a selfie, this doesn't count. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to carry that over, so I'm going to take a selfie, because otherwise this didn't happen. <laughs> and, and, and it was funny, it was like by the end, people were like, you've got to take the selfie, otherwise I don't get my degree. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I was kidding, right? All right, so. All right, you all in there? Can you see yourselves? All right, good. I'll do a bunch so we get every angle here. <laughs> 360 selfie, I need a panorama selfie somehow. All right, we got everyone. All right, thank you everybody.